Hello, and a very warm welcome to the Telegraph Book Club's May event with the wonderful Alison Weir here talking about her latest book, Henry VIII, The Heart and the Crown. Here's my beloved copy here. Um, we're going to have a great evening, an hour conversation, including a lot of your questions which have been pre-submitted to me. I'm so excited to hear about Alison, about the book, and all about you know these really fantastic questions you've submitted to me. I'm Kate Williams. I'm a professor of history, author of 10 historical books, most recently on Mary Queen of Scots, broadcaster, uh, CNN's royal historian and friend of Alison's. So it's wonderful to be here with you and be with all of you as well. So if you, uh, you can make the video full screen by clicking on the square on the bottom right hand corner. But if you're having any problems with the connection or, or, the, or the visuals, do email extra at telegraph.co.uk and they are there to help you. So we can't take any questions now, we've already taken them, but any problems, housekeeping problems, just drop them a line. So I'm thrilled to be here with Alison. Um, she is a Sunday Times, New York Times, world bestseller. She's published more than 30 books, absolutely incredible, 30 books, including the, the Tudor Rose trilogy, um, about three generations of history's most iconic family, the Tudors, and um, the wildly acclaimed six Tudor wives, all of which were Sunday Times bestsellers. Alison sold all over the world, you know, huge translations into all over the all over the world, and you know, these amazing amazing books that she writes and there's you know the detail that she has in the books is, is something I really love I love Alison's detail I love the, the involvement I love her passion I've spoken with Alison a lot of occasions and the passion she has for history Tudor history women's history and you know the the real the real behind closed doors of what happens is so exciting so let's go I've got loads of questions and I'm going to start with a few of mine so this is, you know, this is a pretty big book, Alison. It is. Quite a lot of words. It is. And uh, so you start with him as a child, uh, missing his mother, and we take him to the end of his life. So you pretty much go from uh, cradle to grave. You really do show a huge amount of life. I mean, a lot of stuff happened in Henry VIII's life. But, you know, it wasn't one where he was just sitting around in Hampton Court saying, what shall I do next? He was a pretty busy guy. Exactly. And it was very hard, Kate, to choose the themes for the book from the so many, so many storylines I could have gone for. And, and also, there's a cast of hundreds, many of them historical titans. And no pressure there, basically. To, and also to live up to Henry VIII. What a challenge to write a novel about one of Henry's, one of history's most iconic figures, and to do it from his point of view solely. Because having written the Six Tudor Queens series, each book solely from each of his queen's point of view, um, I did think Henry should have his say, and thankfully my publishers agreed. It's very interesting because, as you say, there's a huge cast of characters. And that must be quite difficult because, you know, there are so many characters that go in and out. Because in a, real, in, a, in a real life, we have so many people who move in and out of our lives. But in a novel, we need a bit more consistency. So it must have been difficult to work out which characters to cut out. Yes, it was. I mean, I could, there were, there, as I said, there were so many storylines I could have developed. And I chose the characters who would move Henry's story along, who were important in his life, and who also helped to reveal various aspects of his character. Mm, because otherwise, you could just have a, a random ladies in waiting, random courtiers, and so many different people. You could. And if you, even if you have one mention of someone, you've got to give them some context. And, and you, 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 there, then again, you might get your editor saying, could we have more? And the problem is, is length. There are constraints on length, particularly in America. Uh, they're, they're, very, they're very forgiving here. Mm. But it, as, as, as you can see, it turned out to be a very big book. I was quite shocked when I saw it, actually. This I didn't is realize it's, a, going, it's a doorstop. I mean, it'll be good. I, I, I mean, I'm good, like, 25 hours of audiobook is, is here, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Which I presume will be read by Henry VIII himself. And, uh, and so, you know, obviously you were saying that you, he's having his say. And it's fascinating to hear him, his relation to his mm. parents, because somehow I never think of Henry VIII as a child. I always think of himself as a grown adult. Well, having written a biogra biography and a novel about Elizabeth of York, the first, the, the novel is the first book in the Tudor Rose trilogy. And um, she was Henry's mother. She died in 1503 when he was 11, not 12. And, um, and he, I think he mourned her so sincerely. He was too young to see her as a human being with flaws. He idealized her. She was the perfect medieval queen. And I think she became the benchmark against which he judged his wives. Interesting. Yes, you definitely show him as really idealizing her when they say Henry mm. 
you know, be, be rejoiced because she's gone. He's like, I can't because I need her. I want my mother. Yes, he did. Um, and we know that there's a beautiful illumination in the Vox Passionale, a manuscript recently discovered now in the National Library of Wales. And it shows this little boy in a green tunic uh, with his head in his hands, a little red head in his hands, kneeling, weeping against a, a black draped mourning bed. That's his mother's mourning bed. It brings it home vividly how, how Henry mourned of his mother. So you have a lot of the politics, you have a lot of the you know, uh, international situation, but what you really, I think, what we have a lot of here are Henry's feelings, Henry's innermost thoughts. And was, yes. that, was that hard to show him as, a, as a, a human, as a person with heart, as you say, the heart and the crown, to kind of get into Henry's heart? Yes, because his heart often ruled his head and clashed with the political man. And I wanted to show that side of him. He was, he was an old romantic. He was a sentimentalist as well. And he could be very sanctimonious as he got older. And I just wanted to portray Henry as a real, a rounded, a rounded human being, not the caricature we have from Charles Lawton, changing wives and chopping off heads with gleeful alacrity, throwing chicken bones over his shoulder, but a real man, uh, you know, a, a, a real historical personage. And I wanted to bring that to life. And there is a wealth of documentation about him, many, many letters. We have insights into his mind and his character and his opinions and his emotions. Is it, what, what a quote I liked was Wolsey saying that Hampton Court would be a palace of illusions. And I really like the way in which you show place here, Henry's chief palaces. I mean, it's so sad to me that we don't have Greenwich Palace anymore. Yeah, oh, th yes. thanks, thanks, Charles II, for knocking that down. Very helpful. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, I would so love to have that. And obviously, we're are eternally grateful that William Mary ran out of money and, so uh, am I. and had to keep the Henry VIII bit of Hampton <laughs> Court, otherwise we'd have lost that. Yeah. But, but damn Barbara Castlemaine for, for, for knocking down nonsuch. <laughs> <laughs> knocking them all down, you're yes. like, yeah, yeah, you know, boring old Tudor palaces, get rid of this. Yeah. So, you know, but how did you bring about this sense of place and sense of the different palaces? Because that is something that's quite alien to us about the Tudor court, how much they move between, how much they're constantly yes. on the move between palaces. And that's something you've got to get across seamlessly. And I'm fortunate, I've done so much research on, on the palaces and the residences and have visited as many as I can of those that survive. And we've got, we've got a lot of description, we've got a lot of detailing. And if, just a few details can actually convey a place. And that I found was a very interesting aspect of the book. I didn't want it to read like a travelogue, though. You know, you have to, it has mm. to be, in, in, you know, got across to the reader seamlessly. And what is the, you know, what, how do you feel about historical detail? Because, you know, it's a difficult balance, I find, as having written historical mm. novels myself, between all the detail that you want to use to build up that world but also not overloading the story with detail. It's true, and I have read historical novels, not your good self because they're, they're wonderful, but I'm, I have read historical novels where you are bogged down by detail, and I think it's just, it's a question of getting the detail right. And, and I think people love the detail. Sometimes it's in the detail we see the wider picture, and I think that's very important. Because it's difficult, isn't it? Because, um, you know, obviously when I go into a restaurant, I don't note every tiny or th tiny thing. And when Henry no, would don't. go into a banqueting hall, he wouldn't note every yeah. tiny thing. So how do we convey that? And yet, uh, how do we convey what it looks like, but yet it's what show makes the an familiarity? impression on you? Yeah. And that's the sort of thing I want to bring. If you walked into the Great Hall at Hampton Court, you would be overawed. And that's what it was built for. And, and that's the kind of impression I want to get. You know, I want, I want to get across how it would have come across to people in those days. So obviously Henry VIII was a man of many palaces. I mean, the, the about seventy. Yes, the many, mm -hmm. many palaces. Some, yep. some taken from chums like Wolsey, uh, and some, uh, yeah. and some uh, obviously from the monasteries. So, yes. so, but you do you focus mainly on the key palaces here. We don't want to go around wandering around all the extra ones. Again, I had to. It's yeah. a question of length. It's a question yes, of I focusing agree. on what's really important. There were loads of houses I would have liked to include, and some of them are included in the Six Tudor Queen series. But I had to be careful because there were so many important things, more important things to get into the book. And you'd have to, to introduce each one. And you would, absolutely. So I'm just, so think, I mean, I, it's very interesting, you know, with the, with, the, uh, with the wives. So Anne Boleyn, I've just got the section here on page uh, 248 and 249 of Anne Boleyn uh, meeting Henry VIII. And he, beca he became aware of a pair of dark eyes regarding him boldly mm. and held their gaze. It was Anne Boleyn, back at court after her brief spell of disgrace, and where until now he would not have seen anything remarkable in that narrow face and sallow skin, it struck him that here was beauty beyond the ordinary. It was in her eyes, her slender form, her French mannerisms. 
her smiling lips. In that moment, he was stuck by Cupid. He was struck by Cupid's dart of love, but it was more like a thunderbolt. This is the <laughs> end of two four nine. So that's what I call a cliffhanger. It was more than a thunderbolt. So and he's just seen Anne Boleyn playing ball with some other ladies. Mm. So obviously there were all these different questions of how Henry saw Anne Boleyn, how he fell in love with Anne Boleyn. Why did you choose him wandering around outside and, and seeing a ball game? I wanted him to be able to observe her and I wanted to show some movement in the story you know, and what she would, might be doing in her leisure time. And um, I also had to keep to what I'd done in, Six Judah, in the Six Judah Queen series. I had to reconcile the book so that the, all the details married up. In one or two places they didn't because new research, a little bit of new research threw something out. Uh, but no, that I, I just wanted to, to, to portray an everyday scene that to Henry seems special. It's interesting, isn't it? I, I like the idea that Anne Boleyn, you know, almost kind of hooked Henry with her, her fantastic netball skills. You know, this way. <laughs> I wouldn't say with netball. I'm probably just tossing, <laughs> tossing a ball the around. Ball, but, you yes, know, absolutely. Still, they would be the same yes, sort of skills I that think we need to, the get to, to be the goal the movement, attack on the netball the skills now. Movement, you because know, some the say you know, it was seeing her in yeah. a dance, it was seeing her in yes, a mask, yes. but. But you feel it wasn't a dance, it wasn't a mask, it was probably something very, or, a very ordinary moment in court where suddenly he thought, my gosh, that girl I've always been looking at and, and paid no attention to, suddenly he thought, heavens. Well, I wanted to do something different from a mask because, because there's that pivotal moment it, when she appear, makes her debut at the court at in, York Place yeah, uh, in yeah. 1522, when she takes part in a mask. So that's too so I wanted repetitive, to do some, yes. yes, I wanted to do, I've, I've written about that so often, and I wanted to do something different. I use my imagination. I, I, I mean, you know, we, we don't know for sure, so this seems just no, as likely. No, we don't. There are lots, so many things we don't know, and that's where a novelist's creative ability comes in. I like the idea that they met at a very small moment uh, rather than a giant you know a big giant mask either it's mm. a small intimate domestic moment I, I found that very mm. I mean he would have seen her before she was at court he was, she he, served Catherine her, yes. of Aragon he, he would have seen her whenever he visited the Queen's chamber before she was sent home in disgrace and probably afterwards but maybe this is the first time he's actually really looked at her and thought eh, mm. here comes Cupid's bolt yes absolutely <laughs> and it's interesting because you draw a, a sort of parallel just a few pages before we have this collapse of the uh, the 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 emperor the emperor's engagement to Princess Mary. He said he goes for the beautiful Isabella of Portugal, yeah. who also has a, a dowry of nearly a million ducats. You don't want to turn that down. No, you don't. So, no. so you 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 sort of draw this parallel between the collapse of Mary's engagement and suddenly he then spots Anne Boleyn. Yes. Mm. I know, and it's the end of one era almost, yes. the end of this Spanish dominance era, yes. and, and the beginning of another, which is Anne, it also plus, plus Henry's leaning towards the French, and Anne favoured the French, she had French ways. And it's this sort of demarcation line, so it's 1525 the end, to 6. The end of the Spanish alliance, and that really was marked. Yes, it was. So yes, it, was, it, was. It, it was a really cataclysmic thing to him that his daughter was not going to be engaged to the emperor. That was very, very was, bruising was to him. He was furious, absolutely furious. And then, of course, he looks to Spain. He's always, England is always keeping the balance of power between Spain and, uh, Spain and the empire and France. And if you're, not, if you're not allied with one, you ally yourself with the other. Mm. Mm. Because England's a smaller nation, it needs a big ally. Yes, it's been. It's. it's I thought it was so interesting because you know, obviously, we. I like to see. You know, it was. It was all just him happening to, you know, just happened to see Anne Boleyn and thought she was marvelous. But you draw this kind of key. It, it's interwoven with politics. Yes, he, she looks marvelous throwing the ball around, but also he really was moving away from the Spanish alliance. Well, he was. I mean, by this time, he's, Catherine, Catherine of Aragon is past the ways of women, we are told. She cannot bear him any more children. The Spanish alliance has outlived its usefulness. Catherine is redundant, basically. Mm. And while he, I think, I'm sure Henry did retain some love for her, but I don't think it was ever a grand passion in the way it was for Anne Boleyn. I think it was a chivalrous love. He was the knight errant who rescued her from penury. Mm. Um, he, he strayed during his, her first pregnancy, you know, and he'd, the, the marriage had been sort of, you know, um, interspersed with infidelities. But they had, they had a lot in common. But I mean, he, uh, he loved her. She was older than him, she was five and a half years older. I think that had started to really show at this point. And I mean, the King of France said that the king, said that the, the King of England's wife is old and ugly, which is uh, not very nice, of course. But women, eh? That's yeah, how we get judged. Men, eh? I and, should think. <laughs> and uh, so, it's, it's, but so obviously we, we we chart his passion for Anne. But uh, when they do finally get together, mm. you see it from his point of view. 
Yeah. He's terribly disappointed. It's a disappointment. The All cats are grey in the dark. The final mo the final um yeah. romance scene mm -mm. is the fireworks don't go off, do they? No, they don't. And that's how I did that in reverse, because it was written in the Anne Boleyn novel. And and how she feels, she's like, she can't understand it. You know, he's up and off. Yeah. And uh, and and bit he, quick. I know. But yeah. Well, no, 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 no. I meant, I meant after the after mm. the night, he he leaves. He's got something to do politically. She feels a bit deflated, as mm. you can imagine. And then I had to write it in reverse from Henry's point of view. You find out what he's really thinking. What he's really thinking. Mm. He was a bit disappointed. Well, it was. I mean, he, I think he'd been building up and building this up in his mind for years into something that's going to be. I mean, you know, explosively Explosive. wonderful. He'd been waiting for yes. all these but years. But the, the consummation is going to be the ultimate goal. And basically, it's another woman in a bed. You know, and she's, he, I think already by then, he's, he's gone so far with Anne Boleyn, he cannot, he cannot pull out now. And, and I think he felt that, you know, he must continue with this. But I think already the cracks are beginning to show. And Wolsey, uh, you, you, he has a key role here. And yes. I really like the way you humanise him as well. So, you know, we've got ma our major ministers that we have that mm -hmm. are Wolsey and Cromwell. Yeah. And how do we draw a distinction between Wolsey and Cromwell, who are both, who, who are you both in the end are, are, you know, having to do what Henry VIII's bidding and both get executed? It, they do, absolutely. Well, Wolsey doesn't. Wolsey, well, Wolsey, well, we don't sorry, know. It's Wolsey, debatable. Wolsey, Wolsey dies on the way, but, you know, yes, he, he was going to have his head chopped off, wasn't he? Well, I'm he? not sure, because oh. this is before Henry began ex executing people in holy yes, orders. But, that uh, was until 1534. It was Henry that he died. I think, yes, it was. I don't know what would have happened to Wolsey, um, whether Henry would have gone so far, and he did regret what happened to Wolsey, definitely. But, um, I mean, you've got so many different... Wolsey represents the old order, mm. Catholicism, you know, pre-Reformation England. Cromwell is the new guy on the scene, and he is the one who's... He's the reformist, an ardent reformist, and he, both of them great administrators. Uh, but Cromwell, I think, far more rough and ready than Wolsey. Um, far more ruthless, definitely far more ruthless. And so they are, you know, they are very disparate characters, but both very able. And so... We, uh, what I, it's, I, and I think what you show me the world is, you know, when he goes, when Henry VIII goes to get Catherine of Aragon's apartment in the hope of seeing Anne, you really show us the fact that there aren't any women at court apart from ladies in waiting. Mm. So if you're a king and you fancy having a bit of, you know, yep. wandering eye, it's pretty much got to be your wives. It could waiting. be. There also, there were, there were. I mean, courtiers were allowed to bring their wives to live at court with them, and these these ladies could be called upon as temporary extra ladies in waiting to to the queen. So there were other women at court, but only if there was a queen. Mm. If there was no queen, they couldn't bring their wives. There was no queen, they and bring so them. there are only two women. There's the laundress, the king's laundress, and the wife who makes the king's puddings. And I doubt he fancied either of those. <laughs> <laughs> Good time of pudding. Uh, uh, so you know, the vape is. As a queen, the very you need to have beautiful ladies around you to to, to show your presence. It's important to have yes. beautiful aristocratic young ladies around you. Mm. But yeah, it shows up when you're getting older, as poor Catherine of Aragon did, and faded. To have young ladies, you know, who who are, who are going to show that up and make it a contrast is is probably quite painful. And Catherine, so Catherine Howard, um, you know, so when we you know talk about Catherine Howard, you know, wife number five, who um, yeah. you know. You, who it's sometimes said that he staged uh, the recognition of her adultery in Hampton Court. But in here, he just finds a letter and he didn't know about it. Oh, he's bounced into it, just as he was bounced into the situation, you know, the charges against Anne so Boleyn. So you feel he was bounced oh, into... Oh, I think he was. Into, I think into, his behaviour is that of a man. Both wives. I think it's, I think it's the, his behaviour in both cases is that of a man who's completely shocked. Mm. And... He's, and he's, he, he does exactly the same thing when he's first given evidence, like the letter from Cranmer, which is left in his pew. And he's first given evidence and he's, he's sceptical. And he says, go away, I, this isn't enough. I'm not going to believe this. You'll need to find more than this. And in both cases, they lay evidence before him. He cannot ignore. And whether it's true or not is another matter. But as far as Henry's concerned, this is this is a deal changer. It's it, it's 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 cataclysmic. So he's bounced into executing both Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. I don't Howard. think he wanted to execute Catherine Howard, and I couldn't bring that out in the Catherine Howard novel. Uh, there is a report that he was going to keep her in, in 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 Fontainebleau in France. That he was going to keep her in prison for the rest of her life. Uh, the, the Spanish ambassador Chapuis thought he might divorce her, 
Um, but we, but he was uh, the thing is that Catherine Catherine Howard uh, represented the Catholic faction at court, and by then Henry's court is str strictly divided by warring factions, and it was the reformists, some secret Protestants, who actually were on the council at the time. Henry was away on progress; he had the council with him. The more radical members of the council were the ones at Hampton Court who brought her down and certainly made it difficult for Henry to go any other way than to order her execution. So you really feel, yes, yeah, so you feel that he was really pushed into it? Oh, I think he was, yes, absolutely. And I think he was so shattered. He was in such a poor state about it. I mean, it aged him overnight. He was grief stricken. And, um, and, and I think that they took advantage of this. In the reformists. In, yes, I think they, they did. They were the hardliners and they, they were out to get her down. And when she could have defended herself, she could have went there, there because there was, if she would, she, she denied she'd ever been pre-contracted to another man. Mm. If you're pre-contracted in, in before the, the, this period in history, you cannot marry anyone else. It's as binding as a marriage. It has to be yeah. loosed by an ecclesiastical court. And they deliberately did not let her use that as a line of defence. That she, If she's pre-contracted to another man when she marries Henry, as the evidence shows, um, hen, the marriage to Henry is illegal. So the reformists wouldn't let her say that? No, and she could not have committed adultery. Whether she actually did commit adultery is another thing. It, but both she and Thomas Culpepper swore independently they would not pass beyond words, and I believe that. But meeting in her privy it does look a bit dodgy, and the council clearly thought so. Do you feel sorry for her, this young girl? I do, but I, I do feel sorry for what, ha her, for what happened exploited. to her. I'm not sure about abuse. She was older than most people think. Um, there's this, this, I mean, I, I myself have contributed to this because I've, I've done more research since I published my six wives. She was not 15 when she married the king. She was older. And um, she seems to have been quite a bold young lady who, who sort of, you know, pursued men and dropped them when she'd finished with them. And so I don't see her in that way. I don't see her as a victim of abuse. And Anne Boleyn also, he was bounced into executing. He didn't want to execute her either. It was Cromwell who presented him with evidence he could not ignore. So Cromwell and, wanted Anne, but Anne down. Yes, because it, become, it had become a, a vicious power struggle. It was either his head or her. She'd already had her arm on a preacher sermon on Passion Sunday to say that wicked ministers should be executed. Um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a shot across the bows. And Cromwell acted very quickly. Because it's interesting, isn't it? Because obviously lots of, many of us have read the Hilary Mantel uh, books in mm. which it's really implied that Cromwell is the, the instrument of Henry VIII's desires. He's trying, Cromwell is constantly trying to do what Henry VIII wants. I, I, think Crom, I, I think Cromwell advises Henry in a way, and Henry generally likes what Cromwell does. But I think in this case, Cromwell took a great big risk. He actually told Chapuis after, after Anne's execution, he had thought up and plotted the affair of the Queen in which he had taken a great deal of trouble. I don't think you can get around that. I don't think, I don't think so. If Henry told him to do it, it doesn't, Henry's behaviour is not consistent with that. He's like a man who's absolutely shell-shocked. Yeah, so you... So he is a man, you think he's a romantic, he's... He is a romantic, yes, in gets, some instances, yes. He gets bound, and he gets yes. bound. Not at this stage of the marriage. He's a romantic before marriage, put it like that. <laughs> it's, court, it's all about courtly love. And uh, what about the international situation? So, you, you know, Henry's feelings about France and Spain change quite rapidly, don't they? They are allies and they are rivals at the same time, especially Francis I, the King yeah. of France, because Francis is three years younger than Henry. Henry, from 1509, is the young, um, you know, the, the young king in Europe. He's, 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 he's got everything going for him. He's magnificent, he's acclaimed, and and he's got he's so talented, he's intellectual. Uh, he gets golden opinions everywhere. And then suddenly, this younger model comes to the throne in 1515, and he's jealous. And you can see that in, in so many different ways. I like even compares the calf of his leg to the King of France, you know, and, and uh, he, there's, there's a lot of jealousy. But sometimes they are friendly to each other. Um, these, uh, they, I mean, you hear people say these kings hate each other cordially when they meet at the Field of Cloth of Gold. Frenemies. Yeah, frenemies, absolutely, <laughs> yes. There's, there's a lot of rivalry between them. But Francis is, is you know, you can, you can just see it. Francis is commiserating with Henry on the fall of Anne Boleyn. And you can just sort of hit, almost hear the slightly gleeful tone to it. Yes. <laughs> oh, dear. Yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So sorry. <laughs> and Henry breaks from Rome. I mean, this is a cataclysmic event for Henry, for the country, uh, for the world. And, you know, what do you th feel were Henry's personal religious 
adherences? I think Henry was a very devout Christian. He was a devout Catholic. He wrote a book in defence of the seven sacraments against Martin Luther, for which the Pope awarded him the title Defender of the Faith, which is still borne by the monarch today. And, uh, and I think Henry felt very let down by the Pope, who denied him, or didn't deny, but just put off and put off, granting him an annulment of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, because he needed an heir. Mm. Whether he's in love with Anne Boleyn or not, whether mm. he wants to marry her, he desperately needs an needs heir. He cannot foresee a woman ruling successfully. He sees it as unnatural for a woman and to Matilda wield dominion. And Matilda was a disaster. Oh, yeah, That's what she's yeah. seen as a disaster, isn't she? Yeah, not, yeah, she I mean, is. she wasn't given the chance. She is. It's, an, it's not mentioned, but probably it's in the back of everyone's mind since the 12th century. The English have had a mental block about having a queen regnant. This, notwithstanding the fact that there are several successful female rulers as you know, in Europe at this time. Mm. And Henry had huge respect Not for Margaret of Austria, for, for example. And of course, Catherine of Aragon's mother, yes. Isabella of Castile, of for, for whom, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I, I think it's the case that Isabella of Castile, her impact was such that the role of the queen on the chessboard changed. You could only yes. move it one Yes. piece and then after Isabella of Castile there was like well that's not very good so you can you can now you could move the queen all over the chessboard and she became yeah, this so powerful piece so I mean this ultimately powerful queen the mother of Catherine of Aragon that always fascinates me this mother of Catherine of Aragon too. but Henry he just thinks absolutely cannot have a queen it's going to be yeah. a catastrophe it I'm is. going to be invaded by other countries yeah, it's not that it, it's, 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 it would bring in foreign influence because who does she marry? Who does she marry? She marry him. And of course, we see the problem of that with Mary the First. Mary. And Mary Queen of Scots, poor old Mary Queen of Scots, and, and who she and, marries. Oh gosh, yes, I know. I mean, that, that's a disaster right the way through. Uh, but, um, but Elizabeth solved it, of course, by not marrying at all. But nobody, it was seen as unnatural for a woman not, not to, to marry. And then, to there marry. Was, then there's all the anger against her when there is no heir. And, oh, uh, so I know, thanks I to Mary Queen of Scots that there is no answer. You can't win, can you, you in that, in that situation? A, you kind yeah. of need a, a royal sort of... <laughs> <laughs> a royal sort of brood, brood, uh, brood stallion to pop in and then not have any ready rights Absolute, over the child. Absolutely, yes. But, and um, so, so, uh, it's, it's, so Henry, you feel, was a devout Catholic. And yes. When he dies, which you show so beautifully at the end, I don't think that's a spoiler, <laughs> when you, uh, when you, how do you feel he expected things to go after him? He left a male heir and lots of new scholarship is suggesting to us that actually Edward VI we, we often people often thought of him as a sickly child throughout his childhood, but actually no. arguments are that really he was fine. He was, and it was only really at the later end. So, how do you think Henry VIII, Henry VIII saw the future with Edward VI? It, it's rather strange, actually, because the men he promote he appointed to, to, as counsellors, yes, and he didn't want someone, one person in charge. He wanted a, a, a regency council, yes. call it that. And the men he appointed, well, many of them were ardent reformists. I mean, immediately... Some of them were secret Protestants. Yes, And one wonders if Henry just saw the way the wind was blowing, was blowing. in that way. But it's hard to imagine that Henry had, Henry had burned Protestants for heresy and he burned Catholics for allegiance to the Pope. A lot of people were quite confused in the last years of his reign. How not to get burned. Yes, exactly. But, um, but he... Uh, I find it hard to accept that Henry would have authorised or sort of pointed the way to a Protestant government. Maybe he thought that the cause of reform of the church, these people would uphold his own settlement. And that's what Mary tried to fight for during Edward's reign. But, uh, but the, as soon as Henry was dead, England became a Protestant country. It was, I mean, his, his um, arrangements, I'm always so fascinated by the fact that Henry mm. VIII left these plans for this huge tomb, the sort of biggest tomb we might possibly never, see. It was never done. And now never he, all he has is this tiny little square put down by William the Fourth in the St George's Chapel. He wanted a huge tomb, didn't get it finished, and in the end, you know, he borrowed Wolsey's travel book, and then yeah. it ended up with Nelson. Nelson so yeah. he wanted a huge tomb, but he also left. I don't know what you feel. Hasn't he? he also left. I feel he left quite strong instructions of what to be done for Edward VI Regency, but they were almost immediately overridden. They were. Do you think it was he, he could have left them in a better, different way, or it was inevitable? I mean, I, I just wonder how, you know, how I, I'm interested that he had lived through this backbiting court in which everyone is killing each other for power, and then, then yeah. it, that's, you know, immediately that's what starts when Edward VI dies. Do, is it, is it, could he have stopped that from happening? I think the, he was, the I, think, the I think there wasn't a viable opposition party. Mm. Because there have been Catholic and reformist or secret Protestant factions at court for some years. And the Catholic 
faction had been muzzled because the Howards, the leading nobles, the Duke of Norfolk and his son, the Earl of Surrey, had been clapped in the tower. Surrey had been executed right at the end of Henry VIII's reign. Henry did not sign Norfolk's death warrant and Norfolk's stay was premier Catholic peer, stayed in the tower for Edward's reign, was only released by Mary. And then Stephen Gardiner, the Bishop of Winchester, hardline um, Catholic, um, Catholic bishop, he, 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 he'd fallen foul of Henry fallen out of favour. Mm. So there's nobody really strong enough on the other side. To, to oppose. And so Henry's looking for men of ability. And there's no doubt that, you know, some of these people he advanced were men of ability. The Seymours. Cranmer yeah. he trusted, yes. Yeah. The Seymours, of course, were natural counsellors because they're Edward's uncles. Edward's uncles. And there are others, you know. So Henry probably thinks he can entrust the, the government to them. But of course, Edward Seymour um, makes a bid and becomes, you know, he becomes the, the law protector. And then you have Thomas Seymour doing the most random things, trying yes, to kidnap Edward the Sixth and shooting yes, his dog. absolutely, and, and so, marrying the Queen Dowager yes. with indecent haste, yes. So, <laughs> so there probably wasn't a way of making, of, no. st of stopping mm. that sort of Henry massive didn't trust Thomas Seymour, yeah. Before happening, fascinating. Mm. So I've got all these amazing questions, wow. and these are absolutely brilliant questions from the readers. They're, they're really exciting. So I'm just going to try and get through as many as we can. I let's know go. I, Alison said you're, you're a fast lady, okay, so you're, let's you're go. an Olympic question answer, Fire you away. said to me. So Lee says, everyone thinks they know Henry VIII. How do you avoid the myth and create a real person? Because you look at this, you look at primary sources extensively. You look at Henry's letters. You look at the state papers. You look at well, you look at uh, as much as you can, and I've done that over decades. So that's how you avoid. And, and what do. are what do you think are the prevailing myths that we have around Henry VIII? The prevailing myths I said earlier was Char Charles Lawton. You know, this man changing wives and chopping off heads with gleeful alacrity. He, the, the, he's a monster. And that, that there isn't a there isn't a, a, a humane man in there. So you're showing the humane man. I'm as trying to, to the... show him as a as a rounded human being. I'm not saying he wasn't a monster in some <laughs> respect. And um, I mean, obviously, you know, as you, as you say, you know, plenty of people were burned and persecuted. They were and yes, executed. They were. That was the law. And, um, he acted within the law. He was not a tyrant per se. He acted within the How, law. Could, can we let? What about Lady Rochford? You know, with with them. Um, well, yes, with, because with yes, he had an Catherine. act of Parliament to, passed so that she he could execute uh, an insane person. This is Catherine of Arik. This is Catherine Howard's yes. lady in waiting. Yes. She who, she acted as um, sort of a, a go between. A go between, and she'd been obviously the poor. Yeah. She'd also seen her her husband. Yes, executed. she had. And she'd been looked after for that. And yes. and she's Catherine of Catherine Howard's um, lady in waiting, and then she's accused of being a go between. Yes, and so yes, she is. And she goes it's mad. Of treason, and treason, yeah. she goes mad, and then but. There is a law saying you can't execute a mad person. And Henry That's changes right. that. Yes, he does. So Can he's we... acting strictly speaking within the law. Yes, yes. Mm. Do you? Yep. Is that it? Because can, and I think can that, that even aim a bit more to think, the, towards the bad side? I think. Well, yes. I mean, it, it is. But I can. I think at the time, given how treason was viewed as such the most the most heinous crime, and how the king how kingship was viewed, I think most people would have endorsed that by because her behaviour was, as far as most people are concerned, totally reprehensible. Lady Rochford's yes, for, for yes, allowing this to happen. Yes, and for actually actively encouraging it. And uh, so, and Jackie says lots of books about Henry VIII. Mm. What, what, is, what is your the fresh perspective you're going for here? Because I don't think any of them are written entirely from Henry's point of view. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, but no, I mean, I, well, having written all these six novels by you know about his wives, each from their point of view, it was time for to, to look at it, if something the subject from Henry's viewpoint. And John asks, and we have a similar question from Daniel. John says, you know, how can we be sure that the jousting accident was the turning point in Henry's character? And Daniel asks a, a similar question about the jousting accident. How, well, how you know, this impact of the it jousting. It wasn't, he basically. Says, you know, he, and ja <laughs> Daniel says, how much did Henry VIII's jousting accident in 1536 affect his health and temp temper? So you're saying not, not that much? Not at all. Because the source on that, that gives the evidence the that he was accident. at, yes, he, it was, he had a fall from his horse in January 1536. And the papal nuncio in Paris, Rodolfo Pio, Bishop of Faenza, stated that he was out cold for two hours without speaking. Mm. And there's been this theory evolved from this that he had brain damage and that he changed character suddenly. Uh, Rodolfo Pio is one of the most unreliable of observers. His account of the fall of Anne Boleyn four months later is, is littered with errors. And I wouldn't rely on anything he said. What moreover, someone on the spot, Chapuis, and other English observers said he fell. He fell very he fell so heavily. But it was a miracle he wasn't injured, but he took no harm. Mm. And so there's no 
There's no sudden change in character. You can see the trajectory of Henry's frustration getting the better of him over the years. And he starts, um, he starts to, you know, blood is spilled in, in, the, in the so-called great matter in 1534. This is in advance of January 1536. There's no sudden change in Henry. It's a progression. And if you study the whole reign, you can see that. Do, so there's obviously no kind of, you know, so do, we, do you feel it kind of brings him uh, into conf kind of, kind of confront his mortality? The fact that he it yes, does hit I his think head. it does absolutely. I think it brings home to him the fact that um, you know he he needs a son, mm. and and Anne Boleyn at the time is pregnant with a with a with a with a with, a, with and and she loses a son at fifteen weeks pregnant. I, I, if I, they could have told, but they they seem to have. You know, yes, it, it's, fa it's fascinating. That I know it is. Know. I'm not sure they yes, would know, but it without says scans, a fetus yes. of, of fifteen weeks growth. That's what it's yes. described as. Yes, and then I, there were all sorts of theories have come out that that it was there was something deformed about it. But there's not one historical source to support that. Theory. I don't know how they know at fifteen weeks as well. I'm I mean, not sure yes, either. No, yes, was it you know, somebody? Was it Chapuis just being a bit malicious? Well, it, I are, wonder. It's fascinating what you're saying about sources because we are quite dependent on the ambassadors who are watching. We are and, 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 and you know, watching the court, and they can be. Bit yeah. biased. But he, he did, he's biased, but he names his sources, and you can work out. When Henry says he's been seduced into this marriage with Anne Boleyn by sortilages or sorcery, um, we know from Chapuis, Chapuis got the information fourth hand, mm. and it's from a hostile source, so we can discount it. Uh, interesting, isn't it? And I always find it fascinating that, you know, having just watched the coronation, that yeah. the St Edward's crown, that Anne Boleyn wore St Edward's crown when she was crowned as a consort, yeah. I think partly to legitimise her, but also to imply, you know, this is a boy in her, in her stomach, but it wasn't. No, it wasn't. And then it might be, um, listeners may be interested to know that um, there may well be some elements of that crown Anne Boleyn wore in the crown that is now at St Edward's crown today, because although it's often said that it was, it, there was a new crown made, there is an, there is evidence that some of the old crown some was of the bits used and pieces for it. Were yes, kept. Yes, some of the bits some, right. some, someone was like, it's like the coronation. I always think the coronation spoon was kept because someone thought, well, that could be useful for my porridge. I'll keep that. <laughs> Maybe some few little bits yeah. and pieces were held yes. back. It's like yes. it's like the um, it's like the Bayer tapestry that was just kind of abandoned. And I think I think someone found the Bayer tapestry kind of covering over some stuff and thought, oh, I'll look after that. Uh, so well, the people, last bit's missing. Some so. people, yes, well, mm. indeed, which I'm, I'm sure is um, oh, I'm wish sure we had it. Bishop Odo <laughs> popping up and doing his thing, but um, crowning William the Conqueror. That's what I think. But but um, so so you see, I'm sure perhaps someone caught some bits and pieces and perhaps put them in. Put them in the store for later. Could be, could you never be. know. You don't. You know. never put them on the historical eBay. Um, uh, Penny is asking here. You know, she said, "I'm always impressed by the research you put into your characters. How do you research people, historical characters, in such detail?" You look at as many sources as you can. I mean, I'm, I've done that over decades. All the Tudor books I've written, there are extensive bibliographies. So you only need to look at one or two of those to see how many sources you need to look at to get to know these people as far as we can get to know anyone mm. who lived five, four, five hundred years ago. Um, what Richard says, was Henry VIII the worst king? If not, who was? Uh, well, I wouldn't say Henry VIII was the worst king. I mean, he, he, he ended his reign in a, he started his reign in a medieval kingdom. He ended it in a modern state and some would applaud him for that. But I would say Edward II, probably, the one of the worst kings Bad ever. King. Bad king. And George IV. George IV. George IV, yes. Yeah. Edward, Edward II didn't want to rule. No. He wanted to do gardening and digging and things like that, you know. And, and George IV just wanted to hang out with the ladies. Uh, George IV just was a total spend. And divorce his and, wife. Yes. Uh, yeah, Try yeah, and get rid of his wife. Shut his wife out of the corner. Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah. um, so they're the worst kings. <laughs> Henry VIII. Where do, we put it? Where do we put him on the king graph? I wouldn't know. I don't, I'd say two thirds a lot. I would say he, there's a lot that you know, we can thank Henry for. Depends on our religious viewpoint, of course. Mm. If you're Catholic, you would have a far dimmer view of Henry than someone who is Protestant. Mm. And what's the most surprising fact, says Sinead, uh, that you discovered about Henry VIII in your research? Oh my goodness, now you've bounced it on me. Um, that I think, well, there are so many actually, but two, what, one, two that come to mind is that I think um, that he was almost certainly the father of, Ma of Aunt Mary Boleyn's daughter, mm. Catherine Carey. Mm. But there was a legal presumption then, of course, that, uh, that, that, that the husband was the father of, the ch of a woman's yes, child. Yes, yes. Um, also, there is another that he probably was the, um, the father of Ethelred of Malt who was brought up as the, I think she was, she was, she was brought up in a lowly position at court 
but she was given incredibly great, great, greatest mm. monastic estate. Suspicious. Very odd, yes. Suspicious, yes. There's, prob there's probably a lot more if I had more time to give thought to that. <laughs> Volume two. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, Martin asks, is there any evidence that Henry ever regretted ridding, ridding, ridding himself of any of his wives? Not really, no. no. I, mean, I mean, he didn't. I mean, he obviously mourned Jane Seymour, the one he didn't yeah. rid himself of. Yes. She was taken from him. He was very grieved. Um, but no, there is no evidence at all. Certainly, no evidence he regretted having Anne Boleyn executed or Catherine Howard. I just uh, this is, Ron, do we think? Is it? You know, I often think this about queens in childbirth that they actually get almost worse served than the average woman. They do, and statistics. There's such statistics as can be gathered show that the outcome was probably the same for women across all classes. So they didn't understand hygiene. This was the problem. Yeah. You know, because sometimes with people like, I uh, say, Princess Charlotte, daughter of George the yes, Fourth, they could have. If they, they didn't. They, they waited so long to intervene they because did. they were terrified. They were frightened. They were frightened heiress of, of heiress yeah. of the throne. Do you, was there? Could Jane Seymour have been saved or? The new research I did with the help of two midwives and three doctors and a long-term ER room nurse for the Jane Seymour novel strongly suggests she died of a pulmonary embolus mm. um, bec mm. and, bec and she had two distinct illnesses and neither was puerperal fever. So um, I, think, I don't think she could can't have been saved. Save. No, save. no, she couldn't, no. And um, the qu interesting questions about religion. So we were talked about what, Henry's personal thoughts about religion. We talked a bit about that. Was he a Catholic? Was he a Protestant? He was or was he just Catholic? He was Catholic, mm. and and it was just. And why? How did Henry's daughter? So that Alison asked that question. Reuben asked, how did Henry's daughter end up ruling as a Roman Catholic? Was Henry sympathetic to Catholicism enough to let his daughter's religion slide, or is she just so stubborn? Henry called him, Henry was a Catholic in his view um, right to the end of his life, but he was not a Roman Catholic. He'd broken with Rome. He was head of the Church of England, a Catholic church. Under his son, England turned Protestant. The king was head of a Protestant Church of England. Mary brought the English church back to Rome. She retained her Catholic faith all through Edward's reign when it was dangerous to do so. And she, so she had never, never converted at all. And so she brought England back to what she thought was the true faith. And then, of course, Elizabeth came along and uh, we have the Anglican settlement. England turns Protestant again and it doesn't change back. And it is interesting, isn't it, that obviously Edward VI was the first to, to, to have a Protestant yes, he coronation was. Yes. ceremony. Yes, he, that was. We, yes, he was. It's, yes. The, it's one of the key mm. changes yep. in the coronation ceremony. Yep. I know. Um, and um, uh, uh, B says... His six wives apart, what makes Henry VIII such, uh, such a figure of such popular interest and appeal? He's such a big, um, or a, a big king. He's a, he's a sort of iconic image of a king. And it's, it's not just, it, as it, she says, it's not just the six wives. He steered mm. England through a religious revolution. He founded, he created the most magnificent court in history. We associate him with the Renaissance concept of magnificence. Mm. Um, he's a larger than life character. And he has, there's a lot of tragedy about his life too. There's a lot of, he starts with so much going for him and everything seems to go downhill after a while because had he had a son, we would have seen a very different outcome to his reign. Had a son with Catherine of Aragon. Yeah, a son with, if his three sons by Catherine of Aragon had lived, we would have seen a very different Even one. Outcome. Even one, yes, absolutely. Even one, mm. And yes. that's the tragedy, Henry's tragedy. Yes, and do you think we'd have seen a very different relationship with Spain as well? Oh, I think we would, because it would have been a half Spanish king. I doubt we would have seen a, 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 a Protestant settlement. And because obviously, you know, there was a rise of Protestant sentiment across Europe. How long do you think, it, if Henry hadn't broken from Rome to divorce, how long do you think it would have taken to, cre to for England to sort of? That's bring very in the hard Protestant. to predict. Yes, I know. It's we, a tough we, yes, I know. I mean, Protestant Protest, uh, 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 Lutheranism is infiltrating England in, into the fifteen in the fifteen twenties, and it only only began in fifteen seventeen. Mm. And by 1529, we find the term Protestant being used. Mm. And I think that there would have been a movement, but whether the crown would have you know, supported it at any mm. stage, especially if there's a half Spanish mm. um, a, a king on the throne. Um, and, and Spain has always aligned with the Roman Catholic Church. So I think that would have been you know, a given. Interesting. Um, do you think, so Craig asks, do you think the loss of Catherine of Aragon and Wolsey removed restraining forces on the king? Without him, he became very much more ex extreme in his actions. 
I think it was circumstances that made him extreme in his actions. Uh, maybe Catherine of Aragon had acted as a break, but her power had long gone. Mm. And Wolsey um, had, had, had tried to do what Henry wanted to do. Wolsey became Henry's puppet towards yes. the end, especially in the re region of the great matter, in, in respect to the great matter, trying to get an annulment, trying but he it. didn't want it. He, didn't, he wanted to see Henry married to a French princess. He liked a pro-French policy. Um, he was he was very concerned. He understood that Henry's case was not was not a sound one, but he would not. But um, he did exactly what Henry wanted, and he'd paid the price for it. Price, yeah, big price. Mm. Joanna asked, if you could go back in time, get in your time machine, uh, what piece of advice would you give to Henry VIII? I'd give the piece of advice his tutor did: choose a wife for yourself, marry wisely and well. Um, because he didn't. So you think don't marry Catherine of Aragon in the first well, place? Well, no, don't marry Catherine of Aragon. But I mean, she was older than him. And I know she was, she was 24 when they got married. He was 18. And I don't think it, would have been, it was a very sens sensible idea to marry a woman that much older. You've got to remember, for women, life expectancy at this time is about 29 years. And, the, and given that she's going, starting very late uh, having children, it's not a good bet. I mean, because it's interesting, isn't it, why so many of his wives pregnancies weren't born to term and they seem they were with his mistresses but with the wives mm. i mean do we think there was he had you know some kind of you know condition which made it i don't think there's enough evidence we don't to know suggest either way. that no and also you've got Just to look luck. at the history of, of the you know the, the history and of the royal fam of the families from which the wives came isabella lot of, of castile lost children in infancy um and and anne boleyn's mother had borne her husband every year a child but we don't know i mean there don't seem to be enough for that mm. um, so, and so it, the, I mean, this is a man henry is a man who's fathered 15 known children mm. at least Mm. Seven of them boys, and some of them live to adulthood. Elizabeth lives to 69. We can't say there's something wrong with this man. Peter, if you were a subject at the court of King Henry VIII, who would you like to be, and would it be likely that you'd be able to keep your head? Oh, goodness, I think I'd like to be someone who kept a very low profile. <laughs> Make the king's pudding. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the wife who makes the king's pudding. Yeah, but if you got gave... pudding wrong, maybe you got a head chipped oh off. No, he wasn't, he wasn't that, that, that axe happy. Put it like that. No, I mean, he, gave, he bought a, life, uh, a house in Aldgate. Oh, I'll, I'll be the pudding lady then. Okay, fine. I, I wouldn't mind it being one of the queen's maids of honour. So which someone queen young. would you be a maid um, of honour Which queen would I don't know. No, no. Well, probably Catherine of Aragon. So would you be a maid of honour and then make a good marriage to an aristocrat yes. and then go off and, and live in the country? I a would, long I way would, from court. Absolutely, yes, <laughs> absolutely. I certainly wouldn't want, want to get into the king's path and have his eye light on me. How, if you did, is there any, can you kind of get rid of, what can you do? If, if you're a lady in waiting and the king thinks you look mm. good, can, I mean... Anne Boleyn did. She resisted him to begin with. She, do you think sometimes, I don't think she kind of resisted him but also gave him a tiny bit of hope. Oh, she did. If she you, played the game. If you really, really mm. say, I... I really don't want to get involved with the king is it possible at some stage she allowed certain favors put it like that we know that from the love letters but it's quite clear that some they've had the first if the love letters fall into three three part three lots the first lot in henry's importuning her to be his mistress in the physical sense as we understand it the second lot he's begging her to be his mistress in the courtly sense in which she will have mastery over him and there is not a physical relationship and the third lot, he's not importuning her anymore. He's talking about he's desperate to marry her. And so Henry is holding off, and probably Anne, because they cannot risk an illicit pregnancy when Henry is proclaiming her virtue to the Pope mm. and wants an annulment. So that's it's a very rather different trajectory of that Anne held Henry off for seven years. I don't think that, that actually fits with the fact. So if he, if, if I mean, and, you know, as a lady in waiting, it's, kind of, it's very difficult to hold Henry off because your family are going to be saying... Oh, you know, yeah. get the favour. Get well, favour. I think I think I think that's what made Anne quite um, neurotic so over the years Mary. because she had to keep Henry's interest while holding him, well, holding him off, or while or, or mm. sharing with him in this mutual frustration because they they've agreed to wait until mm. they marry. In fact, they they consummate their relationship as soon as the Archbishop of Canterbury dies, <laughs> and who's opposed the the the, the, the annulment. And they know Thomas Cranmer is going to be coming in as Archbishop, and then the path will be clear for them. So she conceives probably before they, before they marry. Uh, Stephen asks, we tend to remember Henry in a fairly benign way, but in reality he was a cruel, bloody tyrant with little respect for human life. Do, we think, do you think we should change the way we remember his life and reign? 
I think, I think, as I, I mentioned, the, I've dealt with the tyranny aspect of this earlier. Uh, it was bloodthirsty in our terms, but you also have to look at it in, in the context of the 16th century and why he did what he did. And it, treason was considered such a dreadful crime, it had to be punished savagely as a deterrent to others. And one has to look at the way one looks at, um, at monarchy and the sanctity of monarchy. The king's the Lord's anointed, he's set apart from other mortals. The king can do no wrong. There's a, a, a the, 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 the theory is the king's law is God's law. The royal prerogative is the will of God working through the will of the king. When you look at the, the kingship in that respect, you can see why treason is punished so, so harshly. And there's a, uh, both Susan and Krista are asking, uh, how do you not, because Henry VIII has been portrayed so many times, how do you manage to find a fresh perspective? How do you manage not, in Krista's words, not to run out of ideas? Now, I don't think you're in any danger of running out of ideas. No, How in do you fact, run out? I had too many yeah, ideas. I couldn't include them all in the book. Just in book. I just wanted to fictionalise the research I had done on Henry mm. and didn't really think about it that way and thinking, well, perhaps I can bring something new to this, writing it from his point of view. And uh, so um, David's asking about Elizabeth of York. Uh, interesting question about Elizabeth. You know, to get the crown of England, she had to marry someone but it wouldn't have been respect, acceptable for her to be monarch in her own right. Why was it acceptable for um, Mary, Elizabeth and Jane, but not Elizabeth of York? It was circumstances. I mean, I mean, nobody can, I mean, clearly, Richard III clearly thought that Elizabeth of York had good title to the throne. He wanted to marry her himself. Um, and then Henry Tudor, of course, Henry VII married her. And, but would not acknowledge that he owed his throne to her, although Henry VIII did acknowledge it. But no one at the time put forward an argument that Elizabeth of York should be Queen Regnant. But when come to mm. come to the end of Edward's reign, when the when the when when Henry VIII, Edward's sisters Mary and Elizabeth have been restored to the succession, but are still deemed illegitimate. And then Edward wants to maintain the Protestant settlement, but he knows that if Mary comes to the throne, she is going to restore Catholicism. It's, it's the lesser of two eats. So he, he disinherits both of his, his sisters and, and names and, and Lady Jane Grey, his mm. cousin, as heiress, because she's a, she's a stout Protestant. Mm. And, and that's how England came to have a female ruler, although was, Jane was young. She was married to uh, Northumberland. He was Lord President of the Council. He was ruling England in Edward's name. She was married to Northumberland's son. And it looked as if Northumberland was going to treat her as a puppet and rule through her. And, you know, when Edward tried to say, I wanted to be Jane, there was quite a lot of shock, wasn't there? Quite a lot of people tried but to discourage him. Nobody knew her. Quite a, quite a lot yeah. of people just tried to discourage him, didn't yes, they? They said, you know, lots of, lots well, of very powerful it, courtiers are learning about this. It was a bit of a done deal, though, mm. and they all went along with it. And as soon, I mean, as soon as Mary came to the throne, they like, oh, yeah. tired of popular oh, claim. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, a lot, oh, yes. of, back, a lot, of, back, a lot yes. of backtracking. Oh, yes. She couldn't you're, execute you're, the lot of them, so she had to work with them. She had, they got yeah. away with it, you know. Yeah. Yes, you know, you're just, oh, yes, you are the blood queen after all, and you're very, yeah. actually very popular. Yeah, absolutely, yes. And because it was, she was seen as for legitimacy, and that's why the country rallied to her. And it didn't matter that she was a woman. She was Henry's daughter, and Henry is still held in great esteem by his former subjects. And there is, the, you know, which obviously Elizabeth I, she keeps, yes. she keeps flagging that up, she doesn't does, she? She does, she does, yes. She's the lion's cub. She's and, you the know, lion's cub. And she, all his children makes revered her him. Look a bit more like, makes her look a bit more like him. And, yes. You know, mm. I'm the, and, you know, is there, I mean, you know, not to do what, too much what if, but if Jane Seymour had been John Seymour, would it have been more of a battle for Mary to get the throne because it would have been a, a woman against a male monarch? You mean, sorry, Jane Seymour? If Jane Seymour had been a male, would yes. there have been more support? Henry wouldn't have married her. Do you think Jane Grey? No, sorry, Jane, Jane Grey. Jane Grey. Yeah, 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 Jane yeah. Grey, yeah. yeah. That's a whole unique aspect. Yes, I was thinking that, yeah. <laughs> no, if Jane Grey had been a male, sorry. I still don't think they... The I, th I still be. think that, that the, the country would have rallied to Mary. That Mary, as the, as the daughter, would yes. have legitimate yes. the blood... Because, yeah. because the British monarchy works on blood legitimacy. It if does. you don't it, have that... It does, it does. And, and Mary and Jane was a usurper in accordance with the terms of the Act of Succession. Interesting. Um, uh, Linda is just asking, uh, you know, I, I think we talked about this a bit, 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 we could, bit earlier, we talked about a bit more. Was there an unknown psychological reason why Henry was so quick to anger and dispose of people? I think that's a very difficult question to answer. I think frustration made Henry what, it, what, what he was, as I explained earlier. Mm. And you see the king's temper getting shorter and shorter over the years. He's, he doesn't suffer fools and he, does, he hasn't got the patience now to put up with the op opposition. And as he gets older, this becomes far more pronounced. And Linda is asking about, you know, how, what, 
is there an insight and what, what kind of insights do we get into Henry VIII, the private man, personal diaries, letters? I mean, there are, there are letters. There are there's a load, there's a whole wealth of letters. Lots of them, state papers, recorded utterances, cal diplomatic calendars. There is so much for the period. And you can see so many aspects of Henry. There are also, um, there are also like, like, like um, myths and legends about Henry. And you wonder how these come about. And you sort of try and find their origin and that kind of thing. He's, he's become a part of the public consciousness, mm. part of the mythology of England. And Linda's also asking, uh, what about, what, what influence do you think, any advice we obviously know he loved her. Any advice from his mother? As it? I think, I mean, his mother died when Henry was, um, Henry, you know, he, she knew Henry was going to be king. He was close to her. We mm. know that because at this point in history, Arthur had been sent to Ludlow as Prince mm. of Wales. He was identified with the king. He was the heir. Henry and the younger children, the sisters, were, were kept under the care of the, the London and the nursery palaces. And they were, they, were, they, were, they were very close to their mother who supervised their education. We know from similarities in handwriting between Elizabeth of York and Henry VIII that she probably taught him to read and write mm. when he was mm. very young. We don't know what advice she would have given him. It's very hard to say. Well, she could have told him an awful lot about statecraft. Having yes, lived through I mean, she was a very the powerful of the woman. Roses. I mean, she, she was, she was a very intelligent soft, woman. Soft power. Soft power, yeah. soft power which, which obviously is, is the power that a queen consort gets to do, yeah. which he shows so well with Elizabeth of and York. She does exercise it because it takes pla it, it's, it operates in private. Was that, was that something that Anne Boleyn just couldn't do quite so well, is exercise no. soft power? No, no. Anne Boleyn, Anne Boleyn liked being the mistress with the upper hand. And when I say the word mistress, I'm using that in the courtly sense. She she was the dominant, you know, she, 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 she called the tune with Henry. As soon as they married, Henry's a conventional husband. She has to be the submissive wife. Into, she could not. The equivalent of into the kitchen. Yeah, but, uh, yeah basically. But, but that was yeah, not, she basically. was shocked by that. Yeah, yes. Well, I mean, she just didn't want, she just got so used to flexing her political muscles. And she still continued to do so in some way. Nobody was burned at the stake uh, for heresy when I was queen, mm. for example. A lot of, mm. lot of reformist bishops were, from, uh, were appointed to sees during her, her Interesting. tenure. Interesting, no one was burned mm. at the stake. Mm. And why was the Berlin, Robin was just asking here, why was the Berlin faction so hated? Court. Because they perceived to be upstarts, even though they are descended. You know, Anne's mother was a Howard. Uh, they are perceived to be upstarts. And I mean, Henry is marrying, throwing himself away on a commoner. On a commoner. I mean, only one commoner yep. has his own grandmother, Elizabeth Whitville, has, has, has you know, married into the royal family and be, become queen before this in, in 1464. And people think, people still feel that Henry is throwing himself away on Anne Boleyn. And that there's a huge amount of resentment to court. You know, factions, the Boleyn faction is very powerful. And a lot of people resent that anyway, and they're jealous. They're jealous. You know, it's a court of faction, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And um, if you wrote a book about a contemporary, who would you write about, says, says Teresa? A contemporary? Oh, my goodness. I wouldn't write about a contemporary because I would be worried about libel and slander. You like them dead? I'm, I, quite, quite a few centuries dead, yes, absolutely. <laughs> you yeah. wouldn't write your own memoirs. What about writing your I own have, memoirs? I have, oh, I so, have they, so your contemporary is yourself? Oh, yes. I'd write about myself, but I wouldn't yeah. write about... Um, and I, I think I'd be too... I'm not too kind. I think I'd be kind to everyone else in it. And um, Glenis uh, asks, what inspired you to become a historian? And would you describe yourself as a historian or write of historical fiction? And is there a difference? I would, I would describe myself first and foremost as a historian. Um, the writing the fiction is sort of a spin-off of that. And um, my mother, when I was 14, my mother marched me into a library and said, get a book. <laughs> so I got this novel, very lurid jacket, Henry's Golden Queen. Can you imagine? And, and oh I my gosh. bowed it that was the two moment. two days, sat in an armchair and wouldn't budge. And rushed off. I, I went to the City of London School. I have a wonderful library, and I rushed back to the school. And this this love passion was born overnight. Mm. And went off to the library to find out did they really go on like that in those days, and trying to find out the truth. And and I'm still looking for it now. So if you had your passion for Henry VIII, but if you happened to be at Henry VIII's court, you, you would run a mile. You'd like, uh, okay, I, I think I'll just, I, just make. I wouldn't mind going back for a day. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, come back. Just, yeah, and, come and, back. Yeah. And come back. Yes, come back. Yeah. Not, not, a, not really a great place for women's health, really, no, isn't no, it? No, it's no, really fatal really. having no, a baby. Really. Although, although we, we, we all think of the high-profile things that happen there. There are many, many people, hundreds of people at Henry's court who don't who lead quite normal lives. You know, we have to get this in proportion. Mm. Well, it's been so interesting, so fascinating. You've told us so much. You've been so generous with your time, given us so, so much about Henry and, uh, you know, and, 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 and getting this whole life into this one 
fascinating book. So I'm just kind of, okay, we have a Henry VIII, the movie. Henry VIII, the movie. You and I are going to be extras. We're going to be the pudding ladies running on and off occasionally with absolutely, the pudding. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> what kind of pudding are we going to make? What's the pudding? Oh, um, Eve's pudding, apple Eve's pudding. pudding or something okay, like, we'll make an e yeah, he uh, liked that. He liked, some, he liked pies as yeah, well. Because, you know, Henry, li Henry liked, liked to eat. So, uh, oh, yes. he did like, oh, yes, yes he did. Yes, yes. So yes. we'll bring in some puddings. Um, you know, what, if there was a movie, now we can't have a whole, what, what bit would you feel would be the section that you that might would, that would make, dramatize. Make, make the movie? Yeah. I, think, I think the affair with Anne Boleyn yeah. and her, you know, her, her life with Henry and what happened at the end, it's so dramatic. You, you, this is this is romanticism yeah. at its in its in its purest form. I don't think you you could make you couldn't make it up. And it has such an impact. I mean, it did. It's such it an did impact. have an impact. Absolutely. It, it is. It's always so astonishing to me uh, the impact that these personal feelings had on the lives of. Well, she didn't of have people. an impact on queenship per se. She was she was a one off as queen, and she certainly didn't conform to the medieval ideals of queenship. And and she, but, but but because of this, this makes her unique. It makes mm. her very interesting. It was very influential in her day. Fascinating. So that's the movie. That's the that section. Yeah. And you are going to be an ex, the pudding lady. I don't know about. I have to think about yes. this. What I think I'd like to be something a little slightly higher in rank. Oh, okay. Than the You're going lady. to be maybe maybe a, an yes. lady in Absolutely, waiting. Absolutely. Yes. I'm, I might be. Yes. I know. But one of one of the ones who got away. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much all for these fantastic questions. So many wonderful questions. I think we've managed to cover most of them. But forgive me if there's a question I, I haven't. I think we've talked about so much during this fascinating and wide-ranging conversation. It's been so yeah. generous of Alison to come and talk about so much. And, 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 and so here's the book, Henry VIII, The Heart and the Crown, available from all the bookshops and including the Telegraph bookshop where there is a discount, I believe. And uh, it's, it's been a wonderful evening. It's been so fascinating. And thank you so much for joining us in, in such lovely weather. Thank you for coming in to join us. So I'm so grateful to Alison for I'm grateful talking to, you, to Kate. us and thank you. sharing so much about your research and my just final question is, you've done Henry VIII, Alison. Can you share with us what's next, or is it a secret? It's finished. Oh. It's Mary I, Queen of Sorrows. Mary the Henry's First, daughter. Henry's daughter. Yep. So that is coming next. Next so May. We look forward to that next May, to, to Queen of Sorrows uh, next May. And, uh, well, enjoy the book. Enjoy the book. Do, do go out and get the book. And, Alison, thank you so much. Thank you, Kate.